Our first presenter, Tom Burke, is a labor union and Columbia solidarity activist. Tom traveled to Columbia in December 2003, hosted by the Oil Workers Union of Columbia at a time when pro-government death squads were murdering three Colombian trade unionists every week. Along, and of course, who's the ally to this murdering regime? None other than Washington, D.C. Tom helped, along with other members of the Colombian Action Network, Tom helped to launch the successful boycott of coal. And I hope that all of us in this room are continuing to do that. Uh, boycott Coke, that is. Tom is a spokesperson for the National Committee to Free Ricardo Palmera, a Colombian revolutionary heard, held political prisoner in solidary, solitary confinement by the U.S. government in this country. Isn't that the way that they silence struggle and change in this country all the time? The FBI served Tom and his wife with subpoenas to appear in front of the grand jury on October 19th last year. He is choosing not to participate in a process where the U.S. Attorney has hand-picked the 23 jurors. There is no judge. He is not allowed to have a lawyer. And the proceedings are, are conducted in secrecy away from the public and the press. Tom is a spokesperson for the National Committee to Stop FBI Repression. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Thank you for inviting me to speak in this fine city. I've been here a few times now. I'm starting to get to know people a lot better. And uh, I'm very happy to speak on behalf of the committee to stop FBI repression. And it is our hopes with the committee that we not only defend the 23 people who were subpoenaed to the grand jury in Chicago, but that we can participate in building coalitions and a movement around the cases of scores and scores of people who have been done wrong by the U.S. government. Yes. And we also, in an act of uh, solidarity on the international level, see ourselves as fighters in common with people overseas who are opposed to U.S. war and occupation. And that's why we're here today, to continue that struggle. We will not back down. On September 24th last year, the FBI raided five homes in Chicago and two homes in Minneapolis along with the Anti-War Committee office in Minneapolis. In Grand Rapids, Michigan, my wife and I were followed by the FBI. Um, I was on my way to try to write a press release about the raids in the other cities and I noticed that a car was tailing me because frankly I was lost. I didn't know where I was going and I made a few left turns and I thought it odd that the car behind me made a few left turns. And so I realized, oh, they're tailing me. And uh, so I drove to my wife's work and uh, the FBI uh, roared in to the secure parking lot there behind me and then uh, they got out of their SUV and they talked to myself and my wife met me in the uh, parking garage. So they served us these subpoenas, claiming that they were investigating material support for terrorist groups, foreign, foreign terrorist groups. And I have to say, they, they are intimidating in their presence, but they weren't overly aggressive either. And we asked them, well, are we under arrest? And they said no. And they tried to engage us in conversations and start asking questions. And, you know, they start with fairly mundane questions. But I turned to my wife and I said, we're not speaking to them. <laughs> and then, you know, they wanted to know if I come to her work to eat, eat lunch with her often. And I just said, we're not speaking to them. So she was like, oh yeah, I remember this part. <laughs> and we learned it from other people. And so we just proceeded to only answer what we thought we were required to, which is our name and, you know, do we live at this address on here and such. So 
what was interesting is the woman FBI agent was actually shaking when she handed us the subpoenas. And, you know, when you're in kind of an intense moment, you're thinking, why is she shaking? Really? You know? Like, well, either she doesn't believe in what she's doing, maybe, or they've scared her about us so much, they've built up such a case in their own minds against people who have publicly led anti-war demonstrations of tens of thousands and who have gone on trips that we gather in potluck dinners to create the funds to take a trip to visit trade unionists in Colombia or to go meet the community organizers in the West Bank and Gaza. That in our minds, everything we do is so open and so democratic and transparent that we were shocked that the FBI was raiding homes. We were, we were shocked. We were in disbelief and handing out su subpoenas to us. And for many of us, we have children, young children at home. Our daughter's six, so she was five at the time. Our other friends' children are mostly about five or six. There's a couple of teenagers. But I, I think there's five families with kids who are at home uh, when the raids happen. And for those children, it's very scary to have 20 armed FBI agents going through your toy box, going through your, your high school diary and journals, poetry journals, taking your parents' computers and cell phones and meeting notes, taking a framed photograph of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X off the wall. What could they possibly want with all these things, you know? So, unfortunately for the FBI, in one home in Minnesota, they left behind their whole game plan. It, it, it's a fact, and you can see it on the stopfbi.net website. You can see the plans for the raids, where they tell the FBI agents to bring extra clips of ammunition because these people are dangerous. People like you. The FBI defines as dangerous. Really? That they had 80-something questions about a group that some of us belong to, myself included, called the Freedom Road Socialist Organization. And it's a script right out of the 1950s and McCarthyism. And I invite you to read the questions, every one of them, because I think you won't believe it. It's like going back 50 years, you know, to a time when we thought the question of whether you could believe and speak and organize was settled. But they're trying to recreate that intimidation period like the Cold War. Only now they're defining it as an unending war on terrorism. And the new targets so far have mainly been Arabs and Muslims, as most of this audience well knows. But they're expanding it now to anti-war activists and leftists and Marxists, anyone who believes in socialism. Despite the fact that opinion polls have changed dramatically in the last 10 years, where like a third of young people say they want socialism, and another large segment of working people in this country are saying socialism seems better than the capitalist crisis we currently have. Really? You know, these are the opinion polls from Gallup and other agencies. This is not, not my opinion poll. But the government is in a situation where they have these unending wars in Afghanistan, where they're being pushed out of the country at every turn an occupation in Iraq that they can't control the masses of people despite killing a million people. And now they have a new war they've launched in Libya where the masses across the Middle East and the people of Africa are saying, don't you dare try to set up a new U.S. base in North Africa. Don't you dare come and steal the oil. People have a right to their own countries like we saw with the uprisings of the Arab Spring. And that's the internationalism that we have been working towards as activists in the U.S. 
we're in solidarity with the masses who are rising up to oppose the U.S.-backed governments in the region. And so the U.S., if you're in the White House, you're in a difficult position on ending wars and occupations, an economy that won't bounce back. It's just going further into crisis at this point. Nobody really knows where it's going. You have a situation at home where people are getting fed up. And then you have these groups of activists out there. Maybe they're socialists, maybe they're for you know, peace and justice. Uh, maybe they're based on morality and faith beliefs. But they're coming together and uniting to redefine what kind of society we want. And not just in their heads, but in the streets of this country. So for us, this repression began after 2001. I'm sure as the other speakers will point out very clearly, that's when it changed in this country. It was in the lead up to the Republican National Convention that we built a broad coalition of anti-war groups in this country. Mind you, at a time when some people in our own movement were saying, you won't be able to get these folks and these folks in the same room. But we did it in St. Paul, Minnesota. And we led a mass march against Cheney and the, Rep the Republicans and Bush and the Republicans and most importantly against John McCain's nomination and the Republicans. 30,000 people came to St. Paul, Minnesota to march. They tried to put it somewhere far away from most of the cities, but we still came out and many people from here were at that march. At that time they placed an agent into our groups, the anti-war committee. And then that person joined the Freedom Road Socialist Organization. And we've exposed that on our website as well, and people should study that. Because when indictments come and a trial begins, it'll all be based around that woman's lies. Karen Sullivan is her fake, fake name. That's what they'll base the case on, are the lies of their agent, who's paid to do these things and lied to all of us. So we expect the lies to continue in the courtroom. But after the raids, there was a movement that rose up and as shocked as we were, we were overwhelmed. Within two weeks, there were more than 70 protests in the country. And then in December, they subpoenaed nine more activists in Chicago, mostly Arab or Palestine solidarity activists. And then in January, we held 70 protests across the US and in other countries when their grand jury date came up. Then in February, we held four regional conferences in North Carolina, New York City, Chicago, and the Bay Area. And we had over 800 participants. And we didn't just talk about the repression of the 23 people subpoenaed. We also spoke with panels of Muslims, African Americans, immigrant rights organizers, Chicano and Mexicano, to broaden out the movement and include lots of people together and to start to learn from each other how to oppose this and push back better and how to put an end to the Patriot Act, you know? We're very focused on our own cases, that's true. But we unite and work with others, including people trying to pass legislation like the Justice Act, which will make most of this repression go away and restore our civil rights and basically our right to speak and to organize. So since then, there's been other developments that we've faced. Hatam Abudeya, Palestinian American leader out of Chicago, who's one of the 23 and whose home was raided. His bank froze his account, but we acted quickly and had hundreds of phone calls. And the US Attorney's Office said, it wasn't us. And we said, well, who, the bank said that the government told them to close his bank account. So then we were pointed towards Washington, D.C. to another department in the government that deals with foreign assets and the Treasury Department. So we targeted them the next day. They, they responded by going to Al Jazeera and other news outlets and saying it definitely wasn't us. So we went back to the bank and we said, what's going on here? 
and they mumbled things about the Joint Terrorism Task Force, and then they said, we'll give Hatham and his wife their money, and they will close their account right away. So our action makes a difference, and we thank you for responding if you're one of those people. The next thing they did is they raided the home of longtime anti-war activist and Chicano leader Carlos Montes in Los Angeles. They did it saying that years ago he had committed a crime and that it was illegal for him to hold weapons in his house. He had permits and everything. He's facing six felony counts. He could end up doing 18 years in prison. He's 62 years old. So you know where that would lead him. You know, it's a life sentence. We're mobilizing around this because there's already the trial begun. He went and pled not guilty on July 6th. We don't think the government has any evidence that he was ever a felon. That's what we believe. And we understand that when the FBI comes to question you in the back of the cop car after you've been arrested for supposedly other charges, and they ask you about your political affiliations, that this has nothing to do with that. It's just the new COINTELPRO type repression. And Carlos has faced a lot of repression in his days, starting in the 60s with the Brown Berets. And there's a famous movie called Walkout, in which a Hollywood actor portrays Carlos, who was part of the LA school reform movements of the 60s and the Chicano civil rights movements. So we're going to ask you to do some things for us, though. We need you to go on our website and sign, uh, sign a petition for Carlos Montes that the International Action Center has put out there for us. We're also asking you, I have sheets for the Pledge to Resist, which says, if any of the 23 are indicted, I will organize and attend a protest in my city or town, whether it's New York or Kalamazoo. I'll be out on the streets. And finally, we're engaged with other anti-war groups now and trade unions. We've already talked to trade unions and to faith-based organizations around Chicago and nationally who are going to build a protest against NATO. NATO are the ones bombing Libya and against the G8. That's the eight wealthy industrial countries that are having a conference in Chicago next May. And we're going to try to shut their conference down and let them know we will not stand for war, we will not stand for repression, and we join with the rest of the world in putting an end to these things. Thank you. All right. <laughs>